नमस्कार एंड वेलकम टू बी आई सी टॉक्स अ पॉडकास्ट बाय बैंगलोर इंटरनेशनल सेंटर ब्रिंग इन यू कॉन्वर्जेशन दैट मूव इन फॉर्म एंड एनकरेज डिस्कॉस Now, absolutely you can go wrong even you know renowned scholars go wrong right even great sanskritists could go wrong there's been debate between about you know the translations that various scholars have used and this happens all the time so anyone can go wrong and it's completely possible someone may actually come up with a particular reading and say that you know here this is why i think your reading is not tenable I, and absolutely i think anything that you undertake it work that you know you should do with humility you should do with caution you should do with rigor you know there have been some 1800 or so translations of the gita so i would say that because it's had this long life in translation already it's a wonderful thing that you know we can comment on it in that way as well so that's what i would say that the readings have different kinds of weight yeah examining the challenges posed by the present day global order including political instability the rise of authoritarianism the epidemic of fake news and subversion of democracy through the weaponization of social media the backlash against the rights of caste ethnic or racial minorities and climate change the dialogue in this episode between author and associate professor of communication santa clara university rohit chopra and writer and journalist salil tripathi will address what the geeta may offer in helping us respond to such demands and where it may fall silent how for instance might we reconcile the endorsement of patriarchy and a hierarchical caste order in the gita with modern day notions of rights justice and dignity the discussion also speaks to the urgent need for evaluating the gita on the basis of a framework of public reason rather than of religious authority This episode was adapted from a BIC stream session originally broadcast on 1st October 2021. Thank you. Uh, good evening to everyone in India and very early good morning to you Rohit and some of your friends who I see are in the participants from the west coast and good afternoon to those somewhere in the middle in Europe. Actions have consequences. and actions are to be taken in an environment of uncertainty i am not a student of philosophy or religion or law for that matter but i did study economics and john kenneth galbraith wrote this famous book called the age of uncertainty from the cricket captain who decides to bat or field the farmer who decides to sow wheat or corn the investor picking between natural gas or renewables the iit graduate who has to choose between joining an it firm or getting an mba and join goldman sachs later and the mother who decides to eat one chapati less to give one more chapati to her daughter we all face decisions which are moral uh, reasoning behind it and factors behind it these decisions are, are made in the face of uncertainty and each of these decisions has a consequence a steel plant closes in america what has caused it are factors ranging from an exchange rate manipulation labor costs corporate debt investor greed more industrious workers in a distant plant in china pollution control measures at home the worker has a sense of powerlessness he must do his duty but rewards are beyond his efforts he cannot control the consequences there is agency but it exists only in name and it accentuates our differences the worker who has lost the job finds it easier to blame it on an outsider it's a mexican immigrant in america or the settler in assam who has come in from the plains the family who eats meat or worships a different god and has come in the neighborhood our weirds toward the charismatic leader who assuages pain and reminding you that even if you are the majority it's not your fault really he will make you feel powerful again think of slobodan milosevic benjamin netanyahu uh, rajip uh, uh, erdogan rodrigo duterte bolsonaro and indeed narendra modi that leads to a sense of permanent rivalries us and them ours and theirs we and the others this otherization colors are thinking dividing us between red states and blue states in america between those who believe in saffron and the tricolor in india and the vaccinated and unvaccinated in many parts of the world this is a led grim landscape and there is need for a way forward is it forward way forward coming through religion through ethics through philosophy 
Is there a singular way? Can it be found in one book? And is that one book the Bible, the Quran, the Ramayan? Or as Rohit attempts to answer in this new book, is it the Gita? And if so, how and what are the limitations? And how do we read Gita? What kind of book, book is, is it, Rohit? Is it the book that everyone who has lived through the Indian experience thinks has read it without actually having read it? I think you quote Ramanujan or Amit Chaudhary further up in the book uh, saying something similar. So is it a religious text? Are we trying to find a way out of this confusing mess which you present in a you know, polymath manner? Because you, know, you quote Heidegger on one hand and journalists on the other, and you quote politicians and even you know, ancient philosophers. So is it a religious text? All right, wonderful question. First of all, I want to thank BIC. I just uh, want to thank Salil. I think this is the third long conversation I've had the privilege of having with him in recent times, but I've known him for 20 years, and I, I want to thank Westland. And again, thank you for that, that wonderful, wonderful framing of the question. So my, my sort of quick answer is that, you know, academics love to say yes and no, but I, I don't like that because it means nothing. Yes, it is a religious text. I think we have to recognize it as a religious text. Now, the question is, given that fact, what do we do, do with it? So I'm going to just start by a couple of uh, quick points. One is that I certainly don't think that the Gita or any text should be the only text that should determine our response to any situation, whether it's an ethical situation. So, you know, if we want to think of it as, or any text as like the Bible, I, I tend not to think that there are Bibles of one thing or another, right? That I don't think that you can pick up Jordan Peterson's 12 rules and it will help you lead life or Deepak Chopra for that matter, or even, you know, the Gita or Shakespeare, for instance. Each of these books has something to contribute. Now, for the Gita, a text like the Gita, and we can think of similar religious texts in other traditions, this is a, this is a conundrum. I was, I was actually reading The Caravan, and I know you and I have both written for The Caravan, a very interesting article about how Narendra Modi has actually used the Gita to justify many of his actions, which we know have had you know, less than savory political consequences. And then the it's a really, really good and interesting essay. And I was thinking how this could actually serve as a critique of the kind of point I'm trying to make. So what I, I am suggesting, and I know it seems may even seem like a utopian possibility, is that we should draw on a text like the Gita. We should engage with it critically. But given that, and I know that it comes with this baggage almost, which I'll talk about a little more, but given that, the way in which we judge it, the basis on which we judge its arguments cannot be, ye bhagwan ki marzi hai. this is the final word of God. Because if you do that, then opposing it becomes an act of heresy or blasphemy. And then you get into this territory of who owns religion. Now, even if we were to look at it as a religious text in an ideal situation or, you know, America is less than ideal in many ways, but perhaps you can freely criticize religion more than you can in the Indian context. So, you know, in, in an ideal world, I would say even religious texts as such, we should be free to criticize them. In the Indian context, for instance, you know, where this could this would have a different kind of purchase than it would in the American context, I think you have to essentially make it accessible to everyone, open it out to critique, right? understand its role, contextualize its role, but not see it as the voice of divine authority. Now, is such a project possible at all? My answer to that is that whether you like it or not, texts like the Gita, given their history, are already part of our thinking for a lot of people. People turn to them and people turn to them as the word of God or they look at it critically and so on. So there is one line of thinking which says that, look, just let's not keep texts like this at all. Right, we want texts that are absolutely secular. Let's it only has to be the constitution of India. And I would say that the values that the constitution embodies or the values of secularism, human rights, those have to be paramount. Where the Gita falls short, those values are going to be our touchstone. But the fact of the matter remains that whether it's the Gita, whether it's the Quran, whether it's the Bible, people are drawing on these and on other sources. Right? So if I were to go down the philosophical uh lane a little bit and the academic lane a little bit, the question becomes that, can you have a world of public debate, which is purely secular, even in its sources, right? That can secularism have a positive content of its own? Or even if it comes to 
enshrining, following the value of secularism, do people draw on many sources, including spiritual and religious sources? So that's my sort of general question. Do the realities of India warrant that we, we attempt something like this, or is it too dangerous a proposition? Now, that might be something I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts about as well. Yeah, sure. No, two or three ideas came to me as you were speaking. One was an old quote that, you know, um, Dr. Chagla, M.C. Chagla, who was, uh, you know, a distinguished diplomat and a cabinet minister in the Nehru years. And he wrote this beautiful um, autobiography called Roses in December. And, you know, when the emergency was lifted, he was quite, quite a vocal critic of the emergency as well. And Dr. Chagla had once said, and this is at the heart of what we are getting into as we go forward, that India has allowed religion to degenerate into religiosity. And I think uh, and the whole emphasis on ritual is against the ideas and the spiritual ideas. And the other thing that occurred to me, you know, when you were talking about US and India and being able to challenge religious argument is what the late Christopher Hitchens used to say, you know, that, you know, religion is an idea which can be criticized, but insulting the religious is stupid because, you know, they are people and, you know, they believe in something and you may choose to engage or not engage with them, but it does not mean that you cannot challenge the idea. And I think that's a very good way of framing the whole idea about, you know, are you against Islam or Islamophobia or against Muslims? Because each of these things is a different thing. Just as are you against Hindutva, Hinduism or Hindus? And, you know, challenging Hindutva is a political act. Challenging Hinduism can be a philosophical argument. But, you know, ridiculing Hindus is, is a silly idea in a way because, you know, it's, right. uh, it, it takes... A, so I think that distinction is worth bearing in mind. Now, you spoke about constitution and its paramountcy. And that's what brings me to another of my favorite writers, Salman Rushdie, who always talks about faith, doubt versus reason. Because constitution is a rational product created by people through thinking and ideas and is, is most constitutional. I mean, most li liberal constitutions tend to, you know, may draw on religious ideas, but are not religious documents. I mean, lawyers may treat them as, you know, as, as if they're Delphico. But we all know constitutions are amended, you know, and some constitutions are amended too often, some too little and some too often. So there is an element of reason there. And a book like Gita, however, is based on faith. So when you make a rational argument, about equality for, and you do that in the book, about talking about Dalits and women and how Gita is silent on many of these aspects. And Ambedkar he dislikes many aspects of Gita for that reason. So if that is the context in which we are, when we talk about the constitution, the devout will produce a book and say, but no, this is the divine word. How is, how is it possible to have the dialogue? I mean, it's wonderful you've written this book for those who care about Hinduism and those who care about philosophy, it'll be a great track. But others will simply say, ah, here's this leftist academic from, uh, you know, the left coast of America telling us what to think. Well, th thank you, Sally. That's an absolutely marvelous question. And I'll say that that's one response. And the other response is that, you know, I am apparently also a soft Sanghi now because there has been a strand of left thinking in India and it, I think globally as well, which says that you don't, you, you know, you just do not touch anything that has anything to do with religion, right? That, But I think that by doing that in the Indian context and uh, other contexts as well, you actually seed ground. You seed ground to the right. Now, look, you know, the question is, for every kind of book, there are all kinds of readers. And what I'm going to say will sound a little facile, but it isn't, right? You also have those devoted staff, Star Wars fans, right, who will watch all nine films, and they will absolutely refuse to hear any criticism of any film, and even online, right? You say something about a band uh, on YouTube, and the next thing you know is people are basically saying nasty things about your mother and your father. So that is also a form of reading, right? Now, of course, what is at stake? You know, it's sometimes people will say nasty things, but you won't have a vigilante mob turning up at your house, or you won't have people on social media baying for your blood. So the question is, you have these readerships, right? I would actually say that you look at, even if it were understood purely as a religious text with everything that entails, it should still be open, as Rashti said, as Hitchens said, right? And I know and you and I agree on this, it should still be open to like criticism, right? And even offensive criticism, barring a sort of very high line of hate speech, which is not exclusive to religion. So I think we should not treat religion with kid gloves. Now, again, this in the Indian context, this may seem like, you know, an impossible ask that how do you ensure that people from, you know, different caste, religious backgrounds or gender can criticize this text without getting this pushback. But I think, you know, we need to start doing it. And I'm fully aware that I'm 
I'm saying this personally sitting, you know, on the West Coast of America with a great deal of privilege. And I do not claim to know what the situation is like on the ground. I'm not unsympathetic with a school principal who, you know, may actually have to, or a college principal who may actually have to cancel a talk with a speaker if he knows that, you know, some group of right-wing thugs is going to turn up there. But the question is, the point I want to make is that by, we have arrived here precisely because of that idea that we've taken. Now, coming to the Gita itself, every text, most texts, barring propaganda, have you know, what media studies scholars call polysemy. I mean, there is a richness to them, right? And there is no one necessarily authoritative or final reading. And I think we have to, it's a, it's a paradox in a sense. We have to say that as the voice of divinity in your private life, in your private life, this text means everything to you and one can respect that reading. But that cannot be admissible as a form of public reason. Uh, how do we weigh the different aspects of the Gita, every text has its contradictions and from, again, also depends on the perspective that you're looking at it from. Uh, from our modern day perspective, you know, this is a text that does have contradictions. And in fact, Amit Chaudhary, uh, you know, the Folio Society in America produces these beautiful editions. Several years ago, the Folio Society did a magnificent edition of the Gita and Amit Chaudhary wrote the introduction. And I had a bit of a conversation with Amit and he was kind to, it's the books out of print. He sent me his introduction. He says the Gita is a book that is at war with itself. Tell me so, more why. Well, precisely because of some of the kinds of arguments that I made, and I hadn't unfortunately read Amit's argument. I read an article he wrote. He said, because you have these imperatives that contradict each other, right? He says, one thing he says is you look at this Krishna of the Gita. Everywhere else, right, in all the discourse about Krishna, he's playful, laughing, right? The Krishna of the Gita is the only real sort of form time you see this Krishna who's you know claiming this and and what he says is one way to basically read it is that this text within the religious and philosophical tradition is it's an attempt perhaps to combat the influence of certain other schools of thought and thinking right and so it's a kind of there is a kind of theological debate at work out here you know there are other there's another argument about its tensions uh, which is made by Romila Thapar not by not by Ahmed but using the metaphor of war that what Romila Thapar points out is that this is a text that is on the cusp of a society that's transitioning from a clan society, Kul, to a caste society. So these, the world of the Mahabharata, right, in, in what part of whatever part of like, you know, Northwest India, uh, it was set in, these, the, the, the stories told here are stories of very powerful families. And, and what's happening is that your obligation to your kin, your family members is paramount, but then, once this starts transitioning the norms of to a sort of caste to a caste based society or these these families get more powerful and so on as a king you have to uphold the norms of caste so that's one way of actually understanding where it's krishna not just, it's not just a king it's even those around the king which is why it's a teacher who ends up telling ekalavya to you know uh, oh, chop yes. off his yeah absolutely, so absolutely. there are enablers in the prison system yeah Absolutely. So it's related to a question of power. Now, my point is that, yes, it's a religious text and there are religious frameworks and within religious frameworks, there are more critical readings and, you know, there are less critical readings. So it's not like all religious readers are unsophisticated. So you have religious readings, but it's also philosophical text. It's also historical text. It's also a cultural text. So I'm saying that let's level the playing field, right? And barring a very, very high bar, where, as you said, you know, people are sort of mocking Hindus or, uh, uh, you know, in, 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 in public discourse or whatever. Uh, and again, I'm not saying that even if people do that, you should invoke section 153 or 295. The extreme interpretations will fall by the wayside. But let's have a range of interpretations, right? And we might well say that, look, just given the complicated history of the Gita, maybe we have to be ultra cautious with it. But I think it should be done. It can be done. Now, one last point I'll make, I know I've been going on and we want to make this conversation is, I'm not saying set aside the aspects of the Gita that are not consistent with gender rights or caste rights. We have to keep that in the foreground as well. I think it's important to do that. So I'm not saying that the universalism supersedes it, but am I, I'm not, but on the other hand, I would say that the text is not exhausted by those aspects, right? And I'll leave it at that. 
Yeah, no, and I think the the point you make about this discourse is also very important from a free spirit because you know the book has survived like at least a millennium, if not more. And if it has survived, it can certainly survive a cartoon or, or some criticism or even some vituperative dislike. Uh, message full of dislike that might come from someone. And I think people who want to become warriors defending uh, any book for that matter, it's not just about Gita, have to think themselves, you know, is a book stronger than them or them or they are there to protect the book. I mean, it's, it's worth bearing in mind. And I don't want to put this in a binary mode, this discussion, but is Gita really about action or inaction? Is it telling us that, you know, you have to do your duty, what happens, it's not in your hand, and that keeps you know, India mired in the so-called Nehru rate of growth or Hindu rate of growth, whichever way you want to call it, of 2% growth. That, you know, we right. tried our best, but it's beyond our hand. You know, it's it's matter beyond. So is do we have locus of control? And if so, to what extent? What is to be expected? What is expected of us? And things, if they don't turn out the way they do, where does the fault lie? Okay. Oh, it's an absolutely wonderful question about accountability, right? And again, this is why I would essentially say that the frame in which or or the idea of public reason and, you know, I don't want to get into like the academic weeds with John Rawls. Let me start by basically saying that I believe in any modern society or today that you absolutely need to have the foundation of rights, justice and accountability, right? Justice and rights are at the end of the day about accountability, right? And that framework in many societies, to quote a teacher of mine, Abdullah Yanayim, is that, you know, as a scholar of human rights, that framework is both absolutely necessary, but also radically insufficient, right? So you need to have like content coming from somewhere. The depth. Now, coming back to your question about really what's called Nishkama Karma Yoga, action without consequences, right? How does it essentially relate to the question of responsibility? Does it allow one to abdicate one, one's responsibility? And does it allow one to sort of not take responsibility for the consequences, really, of one's actions? And I think the answer to that is, is, is no, right? The, the way I think about it, uh, you know, I'm not saying that the Gita is the final word on everything. And, and I'm not doing that number, which, you know, a lot of Uncle Ji's do about that. Well, Vedas knew the cure for cancer. Vedas, you know, had the internet and all. But, you know, look at what Marx said about human agency. He said, men who make history but they do not do it in circumstances of their own choosing, which means that we all act under certain constraints, right? And then the actions that you wind up taking, the outcomes that they have may not be what you had intended. And I think that's where the value of the Gita comes in, because I think that paragraph, and I'm going to mention two very quick things about the, that para, that phrase, Nishkama Karma Yoga, it is nowhere in the Gita itself. Mm -hmm. I went on a detective hunt. I had friends who are Sanskritists, asked other Sanskritists. So it comes into, I think, common understanding. And it is one of the legitimate ways in which the Gita is understood. It's part and parcel of how we see the Gita now. So maybe it comes from Gandhi or Aurobindo. That's a different exercise. So the passage basically says that you are entitled to doing what is your action, right? That if you're, and, and you know, this is maybe linked to like the dynamics of caste or whatever, if you should do something, right? You have, you're, you, you're entitled to the action that you have to take by virtue of whatever criteria, but you do not have a right over the fruits of that action, Adhikara. And it's actually a fairly complex passage. I should mention that different people have interpreted it in different ways. But then it says it doesn't mean that inaction is the answer. And the Gita is very clear about this. Throughout the text beyond that, it keeps describing the man of inaction as the lowest of three kind of men. And the first man is the man of equanimity. The second person is the person of passion, who still, you know, it's sort of middle ground, but you're given to impulses. And the third person is the person of inaction. So I make a distinction between non-action and inaction. So this is not a question of inaction. Now, one of the ways in which I've tried to make this relevant, and again, how, how persuasive and successful that is, is, is up for debate, is to say that making a distinction between outcomes and consequences, you can't control outcomes. <laughs> And that's what the failure of like centralized planning was. And I'm absolutely delighted that you brought in economics because I'm not an economist by training, but it seemed to me there were some very interesting resonances in, you know, ideas about, for instance, just, uh, uh, you know, 
projects of like planning or Haikian ideas or ideas about regulation that come from, you know, Gary Becker in the Chicago school, which was that the most well-intended regulation can produce all kinds of complicated effects, which is why you have the office of the regulatory czar and in the US and Cass Sunstein, I mean, every possible regulation that might be introduced, let's say something to do with tech firms, they model a large number of scenarios to think of what the options would be. So I think of the Gita in terms of that, in those sorts of terms. And I make this conceptual distinction about an outcome being something that a guaranteed end you want to get to. But what you must do is you must you must contemplate what the different consequences are ethically, right? And this is where we can draw on a couple of other concepts that this is this could be your dharma. Now, sometimes the best action may be not to act. You know, sometimes you decide that I will just let everything go by. And we do this in our life all the time. You know, you have a colleague who makes an unpleasant remark, right? Do you say something and you make a decision on the spot that you may not? So not doing something may actually be a form of action. Not acting can be a form of action, right? So this is uh, the question the question for us. And so it expands these concepts for me. Now, have people used it to justify, you know, all kinds of barbarisms? Of course. Uh, but, you know, which tech? has not and secular texts have to right i the best one of the best exhibitions i went to is uh, it it was at the folger library in in washington dc they have these original copies of these 16th and 17th texts for which people were actually burnt uh put at the stake or you know executed and this it was called i think dangerous books so books subvert power but books can also be used in the service of power uh, is there anything particular about the text of the Gita that lends itself to it? It's an interesting question. And that's why I start with the book, you know, where Oppenheimer invoked the Gita, but so did Gandhi, right? So we can say that, yes, it's been used in, you know, pre-independence and post-independence India to justify inaction, Hindu rate of growth, violence. But, but it also inspired Mahatma Gandhi, who led the world's largest mass nonviolent move, political movement. Look, uh, several very interesting ideas that came up. I've done some amount of work on complicity uh, in human rights uh, of non-state yeah. actors, particularly companies. And one of the questions often comes up is silence complicity. You know, if you're operating in yeah. Xinjiang, China right now and with what's going on in the Uyghur community, or if you're in Myanmar and with what's going on to Rohingya, by not speaking out, is that good enough or, or, or not? And, and there, are, there are debatable issues about it because sometimes by speaking out, you can actually cause harm. Yeah. So yes, there is a logic to that inaction. And the other part that I found very useful about, you know, the belief in the regulation to do good is similar to the, how you end the book by talking about technology, you know, where people think that it's a, it can always be the force for good and whether it's artificial yeah. intelligence, contact tracing, uh, you know, the deep mind, whichever way we can look at it, they're obviously going to be pitfalls because the unintended consequences are not seen properly. And I think so that's, that's the kind of thinking that that's helpful to know. But I wanted to, you know, play a kind of a mind game of sorts here that if inaction is sometimes justified, do you think it's possible that, you know, when the disrobing of Draupadi begins at that time, if the Pandavas rose and stopped it there and then, there would have been no Mahabharata and no Gita? <laughs> so should they have done it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's exactly, that's that's where our 20th century or 18th, whichever century thinking comes in, or any century thinking comes yeah. in. I mean, you know, this should not stand. That should have been the yeah. policy. So if we look at it, if you look at it as a historical text with a certain kind of distance, as a philological text, I mean, I've had conversations with philosophers, I've had conversations with Indologists, Sanskritists ah. on the book. Uh, so if you look at it in its historical context as a text, you know, you would, yes, I mean, the the obviously uh, the question of gendered violence is is really really troubling and there's a larger sort of philosophical question here and a methodological question here about how do we judge texts that are away from our time right how do we judge acts of violence right is some violence that today we find horrific justified because it was contextually what everyone had to do around that time or do we just say that even by the standards of that time that there is some universal understanding of violence as being bad, you know, to, to use very simplistic language, and therefore, even in its own terms, this is a fundamentally unethical act. So that's one question, right? And historians will will uh, argue about it. But thinking of it as a text that can speak to this present moment of global crisis, absolutely. Now, yes, uh, they should have acted, right? 
So, and this is why I say that that's one of the ways in which we, it's you, if you, because you keep attributing this divine power to it, you know, then you can justify just about anything. And I, I, you know, I, I, in retrospect, the way I framed not wanting to engage with religion could have been done better in the book because I do talk about religious authority and reason a lot. But I say, when I say I don't want to do a religious reading, it's precisely like not to justify everything. Now, would we have had the Mahabharata? Would we have had the Gita? This takes us in a different territory about what the provenance of the Gita itself is. And there's de debate among scholars about whether it was introduced later or whether it's an organic part of the Mahabharata. And there are all kinds of interesting sort of shifts and changes here. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Ramanujan, you know, for instance, says that, uh, I mean, nobody would imagine, uh, you know, the Mahabharata without the Gita, for instance, right? So, so I see it as, we can see it as a kind of double status. I know I'm going in a slightly different direction. You can read it as a standalone text to use contemporary language, or you can read it as a part of the Gita. Uh, but, you know, it's to, to your point, and I, I think there have been some, you know, very interesting retellings of the story of uh, the episode involving Draupadi. Mm. Uh, part of the chilling effect with the rise of the Hindu right over the last 20, 30 years, and, you know, not just the Hindu community in India, but, you know, Muslim, Sikhs, this is, everyone calls for, you know, you can't say anything about our text, you can't desecrate our text. Those kind of readings kind of stopped. So, we should actually have more retellings which challenge that idea. Now, the interesting question would be within that world, were there logics by which these actions could be criticized? And I think, yes, they could. So you could absolutely have a different kind of a feminist or whatever term you want to call it, interpretation of the text. The three I want to mention, I mean, you know, I mean, we don't have to discuss the three interpretations, but three I've been struck by. One is, of course, Iravati Karve and Yuganta is one that immediately comes to my mind. The other is the brilliant uh, Until the Lions by Karthika Nair, which, you know, is a retelling of the Mahabharata from the perspective of um, female character. And the yes. third is Kiran Nagarkar's play, Bedtime Story, you know, which where, you know, the, 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 the monologue or soliloquy that Draupadi has when the disturbing takes place is chilling, absolutely chilling about, you know, when she castigates Krishna for coming very late, that even you were becoming a warrior of yes. thought and not coming. Yeah. And it's a, it's a brilliant uh, piece of writing by Kiran there. So you, you have these, inter and now, of course, uh, uh, a God song, this new set of poems that um, uh, Amit Majumda, the uh, yeah, American yeah. author, has written. So that's also worth it. But, you know, I want to come back to another idea, which is the doubt of Arjun and the certainties of leaders. And, you know, when I read that part in the book, what struck me was a debate between uh, Gandhi and uh, Bose uh, at the time of the independence. Because when Subhash Bose decides, you know, I mean, that he wants to take a particular path and, this, you know, after the Congress where, you know, he has decided to resigned because you know Gandhi and his supporters were not going to support him in in the in the con as, as a congress president and he says that you know I, I think we need a more militant response at that time Gandhi has this letter and I'm quoting from memory so I'm, I'm not uh, exactly quoting it, it right and I don't have the text in front of me but something to the line the effect of that you know the ends that we wish to reach may seem to be same but only appear to be the same but they are not the same, the means matter. And I think that was a key difference between the choices that Bose ends up making, you know, including aligning with the excess power and Gandhi who actually chooses to the quit India movement, you know, and in 1942. So it's something worth bearing in mind because I know that you want to bring in the Gandhian reading. So this is the opportunity to talk about that. If you can tell about why do you think Gandhi's reading matters? Yeah, and <clears throat> again, this doesn't mean that Gandhi is above critique, you know, for instance, you know, Dalit intellectuals and scholars will essentially say that, you know, for Ambedkar, the Gita was a counter-revolutionary text. So Gandhi's reverence for it, in fact, you know, what you might say, uh, only made it that much harder to criticize it. So, you know, when we think of like, you think of Gandhi, I mean, I'm not necessarily a fan of the film Gandhi and Salman Rushdie in Imaginary Homelands has, really takes the film to task. But even in that film, even in popular renditions, you do see Gandhi as a kind of reflective person. And you know that, you know, meditation and thinking was, was an important part of, of who he was. And I, he was often very anguished, right? He didn't know that he was taking the right direction. There is a kind of leap of faith here. 
And I think in some ways he read Gandhi as, you know, one of the translations I look at points out that he's not a literalist. He's not a close reader. He reads the text allegorically, even though he's arguably the most famous reader of the Gita. So Gandhi was also often, you know, indecisive about things and, and had that. And I, what I say is that, you know, we live in a moment, if you look at a popular discourse, if you look at the figures that we revere, we, it's always the person who seems to be of action in an obvious way, right? Visible action. Right. Or it's the person like whether it's Narendra Modi, it's Vladimir Putin, you know, you hear people who otherwise espouse values of democracy, rights, etc. They'll say that, nay, but he's, you know, and a lot of like Indians, we want like this idea of a strong state and a strong leader, right? That was part of Trump's appeal as well. Just rush into it. The person who instinctively knows what to do. And we fetishize this figure, whether it's the entrepreneur or whatever. But I'm seeing that uncertainty, doubt, anguish, right? And what are also very important because they may lead you to a path of action that, that you know, may, may let you see things in different ways. And I think part of that is understanding the limits of your own knowledge. And speaking about the need for leader, actually, Bertolt Brecht has a very famous line in his play Galileo, where Andrea comes to Galileo and says that unhappy is a nation without heroes. And Galileo says, no, unhappy is a nation in need of heroes. That's fantastic. Absolutely. And, you know, I have to mention that this point that you, because we've known each other 20 years, we first were on a common like South Asian journalist discussion list. And I remember you making this point about Chori Chora and saying that for Gandhi, the lesson was the means matter as much as the ends. And to me, that is such a strong ethical principle. And, uh, you know, I think, am I necessarily forcibly reconciling ideas in the Gita to that? I don't necessarily think so. I think it is an interpretation that, like all interpretations, it can be critique. I'm just one other voice. But I think that the text gives us enough. Salil, I want to get to back to this earlier question about, you know, public reason and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the idea and the Indian model of secularism, which, as we know, was not about strict separation of yeah. uh, religion and, and state. Um, and I believe religion and state, again, following the work my, of my professor, Abdullah Yanna, and should be conceptually distinguished from religion and politics. Religion and politics, how do you separate them, right? People make decisions based on their religious beliefs and they're, 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 they're able to. Now, the Indian model was equal embrace of all religions or equal equidistance. How you do that in practice is a very complicated question. But to me, you know, some of the most secular people I've seen are people who are also deeply religious. And I want to go to something that I remember you wrote an article and you in which you mentioned, you know, talking to your mother on about the demolition of the Babri Masjid. And she said, you know, they have killed Gandhi. And to me, that was really very interesting because here is a debate which has been given, a, you know, which is draws on the history of religious conflict. And that's not the only history between Hindus, Muslims, but, and, you know, it's, it was just a very powerful way of understanding it. And I don't know whether your mother was a religious person or not, uh, but, you know, to me, there is something about India, about the model of India that Gandhi embodied and about this act. And I think to me, that is a legitimate kind of reason, right? Gandhi stands for something. And I was just wondering if you could speak to that again, you know, and what your what are your thoughts? Because you've written extensively on religion and rights. You wrote a book, uh, Offense, the Hindu case, right? So what are your thoughts about this? I mean, I, I wish I knew how we reconcile it. I don't. In fact, I shy away and, you know, stay away from the debate largely because it gets too contentious. And, you know, in, in the sense that, uh, I, I mean, routinely, because every time you criticize a particular religion, people immediately come back to say, but what about why? You know, every time I defend, say, Gauri Lankesh or, you know, Siddiq Kapen or any of the journalists uh, facing threat in India, Rana Ayub and Varavara Rao, the poet, and they say, but what about Pakistan? What about, where were you when Salman Rushdie's book was banned? I say, you know, before there was Google, there were libraries. Why don't you go and read what is <laughs> there about Salman Rushdie? So anyway, but or, or for that matter, Danish cartoons or Charlie Hebdo and all that. I mean, it does it's it's you know ad, ad hominem and ad nauseum at the same time that so i kind of it, it almost bores me that kind of a discussion but and i do think that having worked in the human rights sphere for about 20 25 years i do see limitations of approaching equality fairness justice and ideas like that 
from one particular perspective of an ethical strand. You know, uh, I'll give an example. When I was a student at Dartmouth College many, many years ago, you know, 100 years ago, something like that. At that time, uh, I ran the M campus group of Amnesty International. And um, a, a very fine young woman who was a couple of years junior to me was also there. And she was a devout Catholic and she was, she hated torture, she hated death penalty. So she was embraced, I mean, she was, she embraced amnesty as an ideal. And she insisted that I was doing what I did because I was a good Hindu. And I said, no, I'm doing what I'm doing because this is what my mother would be very happy about, you know, um, okay. that, you know, that I'm doing something right to get somebody out of jail, writing a letter or two. Um, I expressed some admiration for Dalai Lama once and another friend, also an Irish Catholic, happens, American Irish Catholic, gave me a book by Dalai Lama as a present. He said, you know, I know that you, you are at heart a Buddhist. So, I mean, I'm not going to say no to such a nice book, you know, so I took it, you know, kindness, compassion and clarity. That was the book he gave me. So, of course, there is something that you can find in every religious book that is useful, just as there's something extremely useful in almost every great work of poetry, great work of art, great work of literature. Mahabharata and Ramayana are terrific examples of great literature. When uh, my son who studied at Cambridge, when he was doing English literature, among the texts he had to read was Bible as a form of literature and not as a form of um, no, religious text at all. And I think there is something to be said about, you know, reading those things as for what they are, but not to see them as the one book that has all the answers. And I think that's why I go back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you know, which culls together and, you know, brings ideas together from various strands and tries to come up with something in a non-denominational manner. So, I mean, do I believe? I don't know. I mean, I do believe in, you know, cricket. So I do think that sometimes Gavaskar, when he bats, it's almost divine, you know. Sometimes when Bims and Joshi sings, it's divine. I mean, I would never... Uh, but I don't want to make light of that. But the fact is that there are aspects of Kishore Amunkar's voice, Malikarjun Mansur's voice, all these things are almost, you know, they're at an elemental level, which are very hard to put into words, almost spiritual significance. Um, but is it is it because of some divine element that I, mean, I don't know. I don't even want to get there. So I'm very happy to, you know, live with the idea of being a healthy agnostic uh, is the way I approach this. And from that perspective, it becomes very easy to address a human rights argument. So, and again, you know, if someone were to tell me that I do this because I'm a good Christian, if it gets contentious, I will say, but then what do you have to say about Catholics and the right to choose on abortion yeah. issues? About Catholicism and gay rights, what do you have to say about that? If someone were to say that, that I do it because I'm a good Muslim, yes, but then how do you explain what is being done in its name, whether it is jihadi violence or whether it's the treatment of women? And if someone says Hindus, I would again point out caste and all the other inequities that are in that field. Buddhism has problems too. Look at what Viratu is doing in... Uh, in Myanmar for the Rohingyas, you know, I mean, so there's no faith which can claim to be completely pure. I mean, that's yeah. uh, a very long answer to your question. Yeah. No, I want to go back to another work of yours, which I don't want to lose sight of because we in seven or eight minutes, we'll have to open it for questions. But before I do that is, you know, I do want to refer to Akshay Mukul's work on Gita Press and the politicization and weaponization of uh, Hinduism that has happened. And he wrote this brilliant book on the Gita Press and what it did to a generation of thinking in, in India uh, at that time. So not to dissect that book further, but that is very neatly tied in with, you know, the spread of technology that you talk about in the book and your other book, you know, the virtual Hindu Rashtra, um, uh, uh, which looks at saffron nationalism and the new media. So if you can just elaborate on that, that how is it that these uh, elements which have weaponized the faith in a way are using the technology to, you know, gain the upper hand Right. And, you know, it's a very, very interesting question about does media simply reflect elements that already exist in society or does media actually shape them? Right. And I think it's it's some of both. Right. Uh, and, you know, we can go back to like the the Gutenberg Bible. Right. We can go back to the printing press, which by various accounts, uh, you know, led to the rise of languages that were vernacular. It led to literacy. It led to mass education. It led to in one theory, democratization, and another theory, nationalism, right? So we know that technology is, you know, sort of immensely, immensely powerful in this way. Now, uh, the question that you're asking, the really deep question, right, is that when you have these kind of technologies of mass communication, is there, is there something in 
the negative message, to put it very crudely and simply, that spreads faster or to use today's language that goes viral in a way that a positive message doesn't, right? And I think it's not an easy kind of question to answer. Um, you know, we know that there is no one-to-one -one correlation between media and social effects. You can't say that you play a video game and you become violent. But on the other hand, we know that when you see the screaming on Indian television channels, what Arnab is doing and so on, you know, it absolutely has. And Navika, and Navika right. we, should be, you know, yeah, we shouldn't forget Navika. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like right up there. Right. That's what's happened. Right. Everyone is competing to be the next Arnab in some way for, you know, eyeballs and so on. Uh, the question now becomes again about, you know, what is the role and the responsibility of the text in all of this? Yes, the Gita Press was militantly Hindu nationalistic and it, you know, starting in the 1920s over a century, it's led to, I think, 70 million copies of the Gita being sold, right? And they publish the Gita, they don't change the content of the Gita, but if it is being published in a certain frame, if it's being seen as a text that advocates for Hindu nationalism, certainly that is part of the history of the of the Gita. A question for me almost becomes, and I'll come to social media again, do we seed the space, right? Or do we try to make that text, frame that text, or bring, have conversations about text, or do we challenge those readings and try and come up with a kind of countermeasure, right? That this is another way in which the text can be understood. And for me, the way to do that is to radically democratize access to it. Let's have criticism of the text, right? Let someone who's a Dalit scholar or a ordinary Dalit reader or a woman, let the interpretations that you mentioned, let people come up with a range of those kind of interpretations. So then what happens is that the kind of framing that the history of the Gita press represents is not so dominant. Now, there is another very interesting question here, which is about the question of responsibility uh, of, you know, is it the responsibility of civil society? Is it of the state? What kind of regulation do you have regarding the circulation of information in general? and especially information that is in, could be potentially incendiary, right? So, so I know, for instance, that in the context of social media discussions, when you look at, uh, you know, what's happened with the way in which Facebook has been used, WhatsApp has been used to foment violence in Sri Lanka, in Myanmar, in India, in, in Brazil, uh, you know, the, the answer of the tech platforms is basically that Technology is a neutral platform. We are a third party. We can't be regulated like media firms. And, uh, you know, their belief is that just more speech is good speech. So people are being abusive or threatening each other or attacking minorities. Let most speak people speak and things will become okay. That self-regulation doesn't happen that way, right? And I think this is one of those cases where you really do need exactly those kind of, that kind of thinking at the policy level about what possible consequences could there be. And I'll give you an example. In the Indian context, right, there was a policy and a very good policy. I think I'm, I'm a child of the Doordarshan era. We got a small uptron TV set after India won the 1983 World Cup. So I remember that, you know, Doordarshan had a policy till they screened the Ramayana of not showing religious content. And I think that was a really, really good kind of policy. Uh, now, you can't stop people from putting up, you know, a quote from the Gita and then saying the vilest things. And you see this on Instagram and Twitter, right? Someone will say the entire world is one family. And then the guy is, you know, a Hindu right winger who's coming up with the most foul abuse, right? Or you will have someone who, you know, will again, maybe have a verse from the Quran, but they're expressing sentiments that are, you know, that see people from other faiths as, as less. That you can't stop. But the fact that, you know, these, these messages can be weaponized or religion can be weaponized in this way. And it's one of the kinds of thinkings think, you know, uh, sort of sources uh, uh, that, that get weaponized, you know, you can have other kinds of like non-religious sources uh, or texts or ideas also being weaponized like anti-vaxxer conspiracies, you know, the left has its crackpot conspiracies, the right has them. So I actually think that state and the platforms really have to come together and there has to be some minimal common understanding of the shared good and some thinking about technology. The, the problem I see with that is, of course, that, you know, the state has an interest to have its own hegemonic needs of certain kinds of messages being privileged over others. And I think it's particularly, uh, you know, challenging in this whole, in the time of the pandemic, because, you know, I think YouTube has just announced today that, you know, they're going to take down every anti-vax video from the platform, which at one level as a temporary measure sounds great, but, you know, 
you know, science is never perfect. I'm, I'm not at all suggesting when for a moment, uh, you know, there's enough overwhelming evidence to show that vaccines are good, uh, except in some cases of medical reasons for not having it. But, you know, to completely crowd it out, then you end up making it look subterranean and give it a level of, uh, uh, you know, power and uh, give it a seductive element to it, which makes it look uh, look greater. And that's that's the problem of banning things. I mean, that's one reason that sunlight being the best disinfectant. Yeah, yeah. But when, when you mentioned this uh, falsehood of moving very quickly, and people usually talk, you know, talk about the, the truth is tying its shoelaces while falsehood is 10 miles away. Actually, it's a very old quote. I just found out Jonathan Swift had said. So I'm wow, talking I didn't know that. Yeah. Falsehood flies and truth comes limping after it, you know, so I think that's, I that's exactly what, where, where we are. Um, and uh, that's, that's where it boils down, that we are in a situation where um, it's very hard to create. And you said the freedom, you know, freedom to speak is one thing, but freedom of reach is important and freedom after speech is important. And I think what, where I think the more thinking needs to be done is what happens freedom after you speak. And it's fine to say something on Facebook, but then after that, if the police are going to arrest you, yep. what happened? And freedom of reach, you know, what, you are, what if you're shadow banned on Twitter? I mean, you had problems on Twitter. I've had a minor problem on Twitter too. And what do you do when that happened? And those are the kind of issues which, I mean, we're now going beyond uh, the, the topic du jour, as it were. But I think they are related to it and I think worth bearing in mind. In this kind of a climate where there is so much weaponization of the message, and given the limitations that Gita has, you know, both you, you talked about caste and, and you know, the treatment and, and, and inclusion and diversity uh, that is your preferred mode. You read Gandhi, but only up to a point. And uh, so why read it? Because your final answer is Gita sings to us in many voices and we should listen to all of them. One of the specially important voices in which it sings is that of Gandhi. Tell me about that relevance today, because I think you also go into this wonderful example at the end of the book about the train, you know, and how Gandhi was opposed yeah. to the idea of train and how your students are appalled. But you do see some logic in it. And if you can just yeah. elaborate yeah. on that before we turn to the sure. audience. So you all, you know, read Gandhi like at your own peril, right? There's one article I, uh, and I, from a long time, I had have an association with a book of Gandhi called Hind Swaraj. Hmm. Uh, which is where he makes this point. And he's, and you know, again, like generalize about Gandhi at your own, um, at your own risk. So there's one reading which says that in part it's kind of a retelling or it's an engagement or it draws on the Gita. But there's another argument which I think I'm also sort of persuaded by, which is, I think, was it you mentioned it about, um, I'm forgetting that Gandhi was actually responding to E.M. Foster. That he wrote Hind Swaraj when he was traveling on a ship and there's some evidence to show almost certainly that there was a copy of Foster and Foster's critique of technology was deeply kind of inspirational to Gandhi. So, but I think, you know, regardless of whether the Gita is a direct uh, inspiration for this particular book where he talks about technology, uh, it certainly has, has a kind of like relevance, right? So, so there's two ideas out there. And the passage that Salil is referring to is that Gandhi in this book is critical of parliamentary democracy, which doesn't mean he's like, you know, anti-democratic inherently in spirit, but he also like rejects Western science and technology. And he says that I'm opposed to the railways because what the railways do is that they make things too easy. Like people have to travel on pilgrimages to like, you know, get karma. And now the, uh, any rogue can just hop onto a train and the railways, I mean, not once, not once does you object to the railways on economic grounds of unemployment. The railways have spread disease. They are, you know, carriers of, uh, you know, sort of all kinds of dangerous vectors and so on. And this puzzled my Indian students or Indian origin students when I taught this course called From Gandhi to Google, because they've been brought up to revere Gandhiji and many of them wanted to be doctors and engineers and so on, right? Um, and what Gandhi is doing is he's actually essentially part of what he's doing is he's rejecting any aspect that the British can claim kind of credit for modernity, industrialization, and so on. But Gandhi's larger point is against what one calls an instrumentalization of technology, or again, going back to ends and means, right? That because this is a modern technology and this is a new technology and innovative, any outcome of it will necessarily be good, right? It's the kind of thinking that says that, uh, you know, once you know about splitting the atom, any consequence of that knowledge, that amazing scientific breakthrough is going to be good. But one of the consequences of that was the nuclear bomb. So I think Gandhi's point essentially was that what it allows you to do also 
is it allows you to get credit for some